Well, I, I guess I've, I've, I've heard and, and seen people that, that made the comment that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And ultimately, I think most of us who enjoy raising livestock want to leave our children and our grandchildren with better animals and a better operation than we had growing up. And therefore, in order to know as much about our cattle as we can, and today with the ability to gather genomic uh, EPDs, and they say that that's as though on a bull, and I guess a female as well, it's as though they've had 23 to 28 calves, depending upon the trait and the heritability of that trait. Um, you know, my granddad went out and bought a bull that was a virgin bull, as far as I know, and he he didn't know hardly anything about that bull as far as data. And yet today we can sell bulls to our commercial producers if we're using genomic and enhanced EPDs and as though they've had 20 some calves. And most of the cows in my day and age growing up would never have 20 calves. Hey, hey, it's Shay, and you're listening to Casual Cattle Conversations, the podcast for cattle producers to explore new ideas that will help improve their overall management practices. Speaking of improving management, I want to encourage you to take a look at the lineup for the quarter two Rancher Mind events. These laid back Q&A calls are between industry experts and fellow beef producers, and quarter two is all about labor challenges. I mean, we're talking how, when, and where to find the right help, when to integrate new technology onto your operation, and how to become a more efficient manager and leader overall. If you want more information on being a part of these producer-driven conversations, head to the show notes and click the link that'll take you straight to my website. With that, let's hear what our guest has to share with us today. All righty. Well, welcome to everyone who's listening. This is part one of a two-part series focused on the seed stock industry, and also technology and data collection within that industry. And so whether you're a seed stock producer or a commercial cattleman, I think there's going to be a lot of value coming from the guests on today as far as talking about um, data, why data collection matters, challenges within the cow-calf industry. And then in part two, we're really going to dive into how to make data collection and analyzing that data more efficient. So Today on the show, I've actually got three guests. I have not done an interview with three guests in a while, and I'm really excited about it because the when I have multiple people on, it always seems to bring about some of the best conversations. So I've got my co-hosts, Ray Williams and Wes Chisholm. Should we just go with co-hosts now, guys? I think so. That works good. <laughs> and those two are from Gallagher, and so they've been on the show quite a bit. And then I have we have Dr. Clint Russ, who is the executive vice president of the Charlet Association, and he is also going to be joining joining us for both parts of this podcast series. So to start off, Clint, would you introduce yourself a little bit and just tell the audience out there a little bit about your background in the beef industry, just briefly, and then what you're doing today? I'll, I'll be brief, but I, I started out on a cattle operation in southern Kansas. I'm a double-bred Hereford breeder, meaning that both, both sets of grandparents raised Hereford cattle. And so growing up, we showed Hereford cattle, showed the ones that we raised. Um, we got involved not only in showing cattle, but my dad thought it was important to go to judging contests and those kinds of things. And I didn't know as a young man how much that would influence what I did and, and who I became as I got older. But um, we, we raised registered cattle quite a ways from town, not as isolated as some, but um, basically my mom and dad started raising cattle in 1960 with our registered herd there in Kansas. And um, we raised strictly registered Hereford cattle for a while. And eventually when I was in college, my dad went to Montana to a dispersal and bought our first Angus cattle and brought home. So we ran both breeds for a period of time. Um, I had, didn't have any idea that I would ever be involved in the Charlet business, but I love Charlet cattle. And I don't just tell you that because that's where I work, but I actually love the cattle. Wes knows he's been with me and looked at cattle and I enjoy looking at cattle and, and maybe there's something wrong with that. I don't think they have a, a, any kind of a club that you have to join if you're a a cattle holic or whatever we call us, but um, some people just really enjoy that, and and I happen to be one of those people. I love my job, by the way. 
<laughs> well, we are excited to have you on the show. And I think there are a lot of people out there listening who would uh, fall into your cattle holic club. Maybe that could be like a new membership area for the show. Casual cattle, cattleholics. <laughs> <laughs> that would be another C Ray. So yeah. Ray, Ray, do you just want to briefly remind folks who you are and what you're doing today? Yeah, my name is Ray Williams. Um, I am the uh, Director of Technical Operations at Gallagher. And um, I have been in the industry for, uh, gosh, I grew up in on my grandparents' uh, farm and uh, raised Angus with them and helped uh, for many, many years and then went off to school and um, became involved with uh, several different operations where I was uh, working directly with farmers and ranchers. And then uh, in the last 12 years, I've been with Gallagher and uh, in various roles from a territory manager to business development manager to uh, my current role in taking care of all of the folks that buy things from us and may need help uh, understanding how it works and uh, troubleshooting and fixing things that come through our, our operations. So support is what I do the most right now. Well, awesome. Wes, can you remind folks what you're doing today too? Yeah, my name is Wes Chisholm. I'm the uh, business development manager for animal performance and traceability for North America for Gallagher. So I take care of the uh, the scales and traceability pieces of our business. Um, I grew up in Kentucky um, by way of Georgia, Oklahoma, and Texas. Um, been in the purebred cattle industry my whole life. My dad and brother still run the farm at home. Um, we've had Charlays and Angus the whole time. And yeah. Um, before coming to Gallagher, shoot, I think seven years ago now, um, I was a territory manager for Charlay and uh, Southwest, so Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Louisiana. So, yep. Well, great. So diving right into the topic of conversation today, you know, maybe Clint, you want to touch on this one first, but what are some of those unique challenges faced by seed stock producers in today's beef industry you know, there are, there are a number of those. We, we could start with one that's basic, and it's not just um, purebred livestock producers, but labor and finding quality labor right now is very difficult. And uh, not only finding the labor, but being able to retain it. And um, everybody's looking for folks who can make decisions and who can explain to other folks that they made a good decision. And um, they're out there, but it seems like they're in other areas. Um, particularly purebred folks I hear complaining that they just lost their, you know, their right hand person that they thought would be there for a long, long time. Um, I guess I've been to three different operations in just in 2023 that complained that they lost um, one of their star performers. And it's, it's been difficult to try to find someone and, and maybe Gallagher suffers from that as well. Uh, we've, we've gone through some hiring here at the AICA. And we've been very fortunate to, uh, to find people to put in positions, but that's a challenge. And then I think just being able to keep up with the Joneses as far as purebred breeders are concerned, the technology and things are moving so quickly to stay on top of it and to keep your operation in the forefront so that your commercial bull buyers can be also in the forefront um, is a challenge. And so um, there are a lot of tools. There's so much available today that neither of my grandparents had to work with when they were raising purebred cattle. Um, I remember my grandfather on my mother's side, I asked him one day how he decided to go and where he decided to go to buy his next herd bull. And he said he went to a place that he could drive to that day, make his purchase and drive back home and get there by dark. And that kind of dictated how far from home he would go. And he basically bought cattle that he liked and he bought from people that he trusted. And that was pretty simple. That was kind of the formula that he, that he used and and he did pretty well in the business doing it that way. But today there's so much more to consider and people go a lot farther from home looking for their next seed stock. And, um, and basically you can do a lot of that from your desk, just simply looking at videos and so forth on, on the internet. Um, the internet has changed our world as far as uh, the purebred cattle operation is concerned. That's absolutely true. My family just had our bull sale, well, I guess a week, almost well, less than a week prior to when we're recording this. And we actually 
had a blizzard over our sale. So we were pretty fortunate to have DV option there and to have um, those videos up beforehand. So the internet has hands down changed how we do sales a lot. So do you think, you know, is it fair to say that the seed stock industry might be more labor intensive than say, maybe some commercial cow calf operations when you look at, you know, increased data collection or trying to keep up with the Joneses? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You know, it depends on how you evaluate that. I, I lived in an area in Southern Kansas where I was just visiting earlier today about one of the commercial producers who eventually won an award for commercial producer of the year in the state of Kansas. And he collected as much data as the purebred breeders. He weighed his calves on a regular basis. He scored his replacement heifers. He synchronized and, and AI'd his, his replacement heifers. He did a lot of things and got the university to help pay for some of that mm -hmm. by providing a herd for them to bring students out to. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't know the basic taking care of cows, feeding cows, calving cows. That part is, is going to be fairly similar. Um, certainly the purebred operation would tend to weigh those calves. The commercial man may not do that. Um, the, the registered breeder, at least growing up where, where I was at, we didn't have DNA to help determine parent verification. Um, we basically ran one bull in a pasture with a group of cows where a commercial producer could run several bulls in with a larger group of cows. So th there's some trade-offs back and forth there. But I really think the producer, the commercial producers that are, pro we call them progressive, I guess, today, the ones that are, that are doing things in a way that we think is, is going to make them the most money, um, they're collecting a lot of data and a lot of information as well. Um, and thanks to folks like Gallagher who provide equipment that make that much easier than it would have been at one time yeah. when we would have collected some of that information when we were younger. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to go back to the data collection piece here in a bit. You know, Wes and Ray, do you have anything to add on to the challenges that you see seed stock producers facing as you're working with producers day to day? Yeah, um, something having my past life when I worked for Charlay, I sold advertising. And that's something that, you know, Dr. Rusk made the comment, keeping up with the Joneses. That's something that that's a cost of doing business that the commercial guys don't really have um, is that advertising and that promotion. I mean, you guys have a bull sale, Shay. I mean, you mm -hmm. understand it costs a lot of money to do that. Um, and those commercial guys, it's not necessarily a cost they have to incur. I mean, they, they like sure like looking at those ads and looking at those sale catalogs, but they don't think of what it costs to get it there. And then that how that should translate into um those profits that you receive from those seed stock sales. Absolutely. The, I mean, the cost standpoint is definitely there. I know um, we DNA test every calf for ourselves, and that is an added cost just to make sure we're doing the best DNA test we can, but make sure that those EPDs are as accurate as possible. And that's an, act, that's an extra cost too. Ray, did I cut you off? No, it's fine. I, I was going to make a comment about the labor piece that uh, Dr. Russ mentioned. Um, he, um, it, did, did, when you were in the university system, did you see an increase or um, what kind of movement did you see with uh, the, the young folks that are going into programs and coming back out, going back out to family farms? One of the things I thought was interesting was I would get a call. I'd probably get five of them, maybe more a year from ranchers who would call and ask yeah. me to send them a, a list of names of 10, 10 of our students who are about to graduate, could be graduate students or could be undergrads that were ready to come out and manage a ranch. Mm. And I told them it wouldn't take very long to make that list because almost none of them were ready to go out and manage a ranch unless they grew up on one and mm -hmm. they probably had a ranch to go home to. But of the ones who aspired to become a rancher and didn't necessarily grow up in it, um, they needed further training, in my opinion, um, yeah. wh whether it's to go to a Texas A&M Kingsville or a TCU ranch management program, there, there are some out there. Um, they needed more, uh, more than my dad had. He didn't go to college, but to have the financial training and, and to be able to manage the data and, you know, all of that technology that Ray deals with on a regular basis, um, these young producers, it, they have a lot to have to deal with. Now, a lot of, of students your age, Shay, that came through the system, th those are the ones we turn to to help us learn how to use the new technology. 
but um, so that they don't have to learn that so much, but just to know how to run a ranch, how to manage a ranch and make it profitable. Um, there's a lot more to it than, than my dad dealt with when he was growing up. Yeah. Well, it, it, oh, go ahead, Jay. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, you know, you talk <clears throat> about, you know, so I grew up on a ranch my whole life was very active. I came back right after I finished my undergrad, like this is my primary focus, but I'm still involved on the ranch almost every day. I grew up on it and I'm not ready to manage a ranch. Like it just, you, it takes experience and there's a lot to learn, especially if you aren't there, especially when you take four years off. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I went home from college. Um, I got married in that process too, right? The next, that fall after I, we graduated, my wife and I from school and first we had to get adjusted to being married. Then we had to get adjusted to coming home to the ranch and, and, you know, my dad reminded us, Hey, we've been lucky to hold this together the last four years while you've been in school. Uh, we need you to step in now and, and take on a bigger role. Um, so we worked on the ranch for five years before we decided to go back to college. And I managed the cow herd at Colorado state. Boy, mm -hmm. did I learn a lot. I, I didn't think I needed that. I thought I knew how to run cows. I'd run cows with my dad. What I had never had experience doing was managing labor. I had never had anyone work under me. I had never managed a budget other than managing my checkbook. I now had to manage a budget, manage student employees who some of were only four or five years younger than I was. Um, it was quite an eye opener. Um, so that that part, I had a lot to learn. And, and it you know every job you take, you learn more and more, but there's a reason why the number of years that you've been around the sun matters um, because you just gain more skills that will help you as a manager someday. There's a lot of folks, and I, I've talked to a lot of you know, students that have come home and um, may not have been as, as fortunate to have um, a family who said, yeah, come please, and let's, let's, let's get you involved in, in, a, in a, a major role in our operation. But moreover, it was like, okay, hot shot. You think you know something? You don't know nothing. And, the, you know, the kids come home with these great skill sets. You know, they've learned a lot of new technologies and uh, it's it's really awesome. And so there's this dynamic that we've run into and I've seen it time and time again where, gosh, dad is just not not having it yet. And then there are success stories where they, they get shown a, a new process that they learned um, out and about when they were out working with other folks. And they go, gosh, if I had been doing it all along this way, I, how much more money would we have made? And it's about survival, right? Coming back to a seed stock operation with such a skill set required and a commercial operation uh, with, like you mentioned, with managing folks, that just can't, that's just daunting to a lot of, lot of, lot of people. And um, I don't know, there's a lot of challenges out there. I mean, it just everything is coming at you at once with market volatility and you know disease management and you know just the whole breeding advancements that are breeding technology advancements that are out there. Um, it's all about how do we make money at this? How do we how much how does it how much does it cost to grow an animal? How is it? It's it's there's a lot to it. That's what it's all about. I I had a lesson that I learned one day when we were working calves, branding calves in the spring, hit me like a hammer. <laughs> I was tattooing, branding, doing all these things. Had a number of students. All the labor that I had there on at the university farm was student labor. I didn't have full anybody full time. And uh, I'm tattooing this calf, and one of the students leans down and he said, "Clint, if you brand every calf and tattoo every calf, we're not going to learn very much today." Wow. I threw it down on the ground and said, "All right, I'm not branding another calf. I'm not tattooing. You guys do it. You've been watching me." Yep. And you know that was that was a huge lesson because really the reason they're there is because they they have aspirations to manage something someday. Yeah. And one one of my best students that I had during the ten years that I was at the farm went on to train the dogs for the Denver Police Department. Now that's not a that's not strictly a livestock purebred livestock job, but he credits the skills that he learned at the university working out there on the cow calf unit to eventually help him to get a job that, that he really loved. And uh, he did that job for years and years and was quite good at it. Yeah, that's but, awesome. uh, yeah that really hit me. I, I, my job is to be there to train, not to do every job. Yeah. And, and I, that's one of those life lessons that I haven't forgotten. And hopefully I won't forget 
that the old 4-H motto of learning by doing is still one of the very best ways to learn a skill. And if you if you just watch other people, you only get to be so good. So Clint, I want to, I really love that conversation about the labor challenge and managing people and how there's a balance between, you know, and everyone on the operation learning how to manage people below them, but also the people who are on the bottom learning to step in and ask to be involved and find their place that's still going to make the operation profitable. That's very important. And I, I see that being a challenge that's in all sectors of the ag industry and not necessarily mm -hmm. just the cow-calf sector or seed stock segment or commercial cow-calf, whatever you want to talk about. Clint, you brought up a point where you were talking about how you've seen seed stock producers collect a lot of data and you've seen commercial cattlemen collect a lot of data. And I've seen a lot of commercial cattlemen who have also, who are also very good about collecting data on their herds, even down to weights, et cetera. So why, why is it important for both commercial cattle producers and seed stock cattle producers to be collecting data on their herds? Like at the end of the day, why do we as cattle producers need to be focused and understand the value in collecting data? Well, I, I guess I've, I've, I've heard and, and seen people that, that made the comment that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And ultimately, I think most of us who enjoy raising livestock want to leave our children and our grandchildren with better animals and a better operation than we had growing up. And therefore, in order to know as much about our cattle as we can, and today with the ability to gather genomic uh, EPDs, and they say that that's as though on a bull, and I guess a female as well, it's as though they've had 23 to 28 calves, depending upon the trait and the heritability of that trait. Um, you know, my granddad went out and bought a bull that was a virgin bull, as far as I know, and he, he didn't know hardly anything about that bull as far as data. And yet today we can sell bulls to our commercial producers if we're using genomic and enhanced EPDs and as though they've had 20 some calves. And most of the cows in my day and age growing up would never have 20 calves. And you know, eventually we started doing embryo transfer and some of those cows can have a lot more than that. But um, the average cow won't have that many calves. And so uh, it's an opportunity to provide our producers if we gather the data as purebred operators and learn as much as we can about the DNA and about the, the, the genetics of those animals, we can pass on a lot of, of things to the commercial producer that will help them to be in a position to make money. And the profit margin some years, depending upon the drought, depending upon rain, can be very thin. And the difference between making it and not making it, the difference between being able to make a land bank payment or not, uh, mm -hmm. may be in doing some of those things that help us to be more profitable or more efficient. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those key data points for commercial cattlemen that the three of you see being important to collect for the commercial cow-calf producer? What are some of those key data points? So one of the things that has struck me, my dad does a lot of work with um, some guys back in Kentucky. He's involved with market news. But one of the aspects of that job is they do a lot with those elite female sales, elite commercial bred heifer sales. Um, and one of the data points that I think has evolved in that business in just the last few years is the pelvic scoring of these commercial heifers. Um, growing up, I never heard that. I don't think anybody was doing it then. But now mm -hmm. it seems like it's if you don't have that, those heifers are discounted, it almost seems like. And the ones that have had it pelvic scored, it's just they're worth that much more. I mean, I know it's it seems like a very simple, trivial thing, but to know those heifers are more than adequate and ready to have a calf and your chances of having calving issues are greatly decreased and having that live calf on the ground to pay for that bred heifer, it just makes them worth that much more, it seems to me. And that was one of those, I don't want to call it a new data point, but it's something that's become more important, I think, in that business. Yeah. Well, while I was at CSU, we, that one of the other things we did besides pelvic measurements were reproductive tract scores. 
And I was fascinated with reproduction. Um, as a young man, my dad went to AI school sometime in the 60s and came home with semen. Um, actually, I don't know if I told Wes this, but he brought home Charlay semen. And we bred some of our commercial Hereford cows to Charlay semen. All my dad had to choose those two bulls. He brought home uh, 10 straws of semen, I believe it was, from, from two different bulls. He had a headshot of that bull. He had no numbers, no, no data, no EPDs, none of that. He just had a headshot. So he didn't even know how big their shoulders were. And uh, <clears throat> some of those calves, unfortunately, were too big for our small framed Hereford cows, commercial Hereford cows. And um, we learned some hard life lessons because of that. But um, I, I just think it's critical to know as much, even in a commercial deal, whether if you sell your calves at weaning, it's important to know what the weaning weights are so that you know which cows are weaning mm -hmm. the heaviest calves, keep track of those cows. And that way, you know which cows you need to get rid of, uh, meaning they, they need to go to the sale barn and we need to replace them with some replacement heifers that hopefully can do a better job. Um, otherwise, you're just writing down notes on the dash of your pickup or whatever, and that's not the best way to to make management decisions. Well, and well we, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Agree. You, you know, and and when we work with folks all over, it, it, it's about that, and it's about what we used to write down on a piece of wood, or like you said, your dash or whatever you've got handy. Heat sack. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, it's all about it's all about writing it on the hand. Yep. And, and then, then going to wash it off, and your dad saying, "Quick, write this down before I wash my hands, as yeah. it's already half smeared." I've been or a part of that. The, the the guy that walks into the office and says, "Honey, here's here's everything you need to know right here. Just 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 go ahead and write this down right here." And she's just he's just covered in you know what and blood, and it's just you know we we've seen it over and over again and it's, it's, a, it's a hard habit to break because it's easy to do. And so, you know, today, um, as you mentioned early on, there's a lot of tools that can allow folks to, to be more efficient and to get that information in where it's safe and they can focus on their animals and doing the things that they need to do and gathering the data that they need to gather at shoot site or wherever they're at on the, on the farm. And um, so, you know, as you said in the past, that we used to do a lot with little, but now it's being more efficient with what we have as well. And um, these evaluations, it's just too, it's just too important to to pass by. And I, I love Clint's uh, analysis of, you know, what is it, if this animal is not making us any money, I don't have the memory capacity to remember one season over another, uh, what happened with this animal, right? Uh, if if they're a cull animal, it's important to get that animal out of my herd. And I can't do that by just trying to remember that. Um, we need to write it down and make sure it's it's done. And everything else that we do from all these genetic evaluations that we're, we're trying to keep track of, uh, it's just all too important to, to let go. Cattle producers have a lot to remember oh. all the time. So I think it's important to rely on a little technology for help. Now, as we kind of wrap up part one, I mean, you guys have talked a lot about some of the challenges seed stock producers face, some things they need to be aware of, the importance of data collection for all cattlemen, because, you know, you can't manage what you don't measure. And if you're not measuring anything, you don't know what's actually going to be profitable for you. And it's hard to have a good business that way. So, but if we look at this data collection from the big picture, if we're looking at it industry wide, how is this data collection for seed stock producers? Let's start there. So, how is data collection for seed stock producers when they're collecting and analyzing that data impacting the commercial cow calf producer, the feedlot, the packer, the retailer, the consumer? Because everything trickles down big picture wise. What does data collection mean for? The other segments of the beef industry when we're doing it on the cow calf end. I got this one, guys. I got a good <laughs> one here. So let's talk about starting at the top. And this kind of goes back to a podcast that we did before, Shay, with Matt. The purchase of that bull. If the purebred guy hasn't collected data on that bull, his performance, his scan data, his genetics, if he hasn't done that, and then the commercial guy, once he's purchased that bull, hasn't went ahead and validated those, whether it's by weighing calves or scanning calves or what have you, 
then by the time it gets to the feedlot, the efficiency of those calves out of that bull, and then further on into the packer, into the meat case, we've done a disservice to the end consumer of that protein product by not doing the very best on each step. And then I think the big challenge that we have is actually getting that data back all the way around to the mm-hmm. purebred producer again mm-hmm. and saying, hey, this is what those calves all the way through the cycle did for you. Um, and I think that's a, I think that is, in my mind anyways, that is how that circle's supposed to go. Um, if everybody does their part all the way through there, we're creating a better set of cattle at all levels of that industry. Yeah, yeah. But I would absolutely agree with that, Wes. I, I know some of the purebred breeders that, that my dad used to brag about and talk about and hold up to us as good examples were people who took time in what he called the off season. But once we got through bull sale season and calving season and somewhere in there before we started AIing, those people would go and visit their commercial producers that were buying their bulls. And not, not just to say thank you for buying my genetics, but to also see firsthand how those genetics were working and to see what kind of changes needed to be made in order to help that commercial producer have even better choices in the following year or 10 years or whatever down the road, we had to be looking ahead to help them stay further ahead. And that's a challenge. And and that part hasn't changed. But I wrote an article recently about customer service. And I still believe customer service, whether you're in the pickup business or the cattle business, it's critical. And some people just do a lot better job of that than others. And to be a top-notch purebred breeder, you have to keep customer service in mind and, and, and find ways to interact with them and learn from them. We learn from each other, but I think there's, I think there's really a need to communicate and, and to go and, and make sure that the product you're producing is really doing what you want it to do and what your produce, commercial producers want it to do to help their operation. It's a building trust situation too. I mean, you, you think about who you're doing business with, like you said, it, it, it's so important that that you can trust the people that um, that have given you product, uh, who've given you stock. And uh, as you point, it, it's so important to know uh, that you care and that it's going to make the improvement of the entire group uh, by understanding these metrics and uh, getting it all the way back to the beginning and just taking an interest in that. Um, it's not good enough just to let them go and, and hope for the best because you find yourself not getting called again. Right. And uh, that repeat business is just so important to know. And it's only going to come from building that trust. That whole concept of I'm going to make a product, whether it's females or bulls, either way, and they're going to buy what I make and not taking into account that customers needs and wants is a, seems to me a really easy way to yeah. get out of the business. Right. It's so important too that um, that when I'm evaluating data, that I've got a system that makes it easy to just look at the at the. I'm looking for exceptions. Basically, there's a lot of data coming through, right? So you're you're really just impacted with a lot of stuff to think about. But if I organize it in a way and I, I utilize technology to help me narrow it down to the things that are most important and the things that jump off the page, I can deal with those those singular items much faster, much easier than I can looking at an entire batch of data. And that scares a lot of folks. I mean, there's a lot to look at. And, you know, when you learn how to do it with just the exceptionals, um, it makes it a lot easier and a lot more efficient for your time. Absolutely. And part two, we are going to dive into how to make data collection efficient and um, simpler for cattle producers. So with that, before we dive into part two, do the three of you have anything else you want to add as far as big picture thinking with the seed stock industry? I would just say that data collection is not different than other jobs on the farm and ranch. Um, If we can make it fun, uh, we're more likely to get people to take part in it. Uh, If we can make it accurate so that the data means something and and, and we can reduce error, um, those are good things. Um, I I remember working with some of the first EID tags and those numbers were small and written around in a circle on a round button tag we're going to put on an animal. (laughs) 
we put them in a bunch of pigs and got to the fair and we were going to analyze those and they chewed on them and they didn't work anymore. That's the only ID we had were those those round button tags. What a mess. Yeah. What a mess. That technology, it wasn't our fault. It wasn't their fault. It just didn't work the way that we applied it. And so we, we've had to learn some things about data and how to manage it, how to collect it, and how to work with it. And that's where, in my mind, a guy like Ray um, is, is invaluable, not only to, to Gallagher, but to the rest of us learning how to, to manage data. We want it to work and make it simple if we can. I think we're all students too. Yeah. We're all students of this business because uh, things are moving so fast right now and so incredibly, it's good, but it's just, we're all students. Nobody can ever say they all know everything there is to know about this stuff. You can go by your instinct and your gut, but there is, there's so much to learn. And uh, gosh, the experiences in the field and with good people that you know, and your neighbors, your, your business associates, we all learn from each other. Right. It's really good. Absolutely. Well, thank you three for well being on the part one of the part two series. Y'all be on part two, two as well. So with that, if you are out there listening today, be sure to tune in next week. Um, the part two will release on Monday, like always. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.